Good morning, and welcome to Sup Georgia Tech Supply Chain and Logistics Institute. Uh, this morning, I'm Lee Hales. I'm with Richard Muther and Associates. Uh, I'm also a senior lecturer here at the Institute. This morning, we're going to take an hour to go through a digest or a preview, if you will, of our three-day workshop that we run here on warehouse and distribution center layout. Uh, the course r will run in November next. Um, those of you that registered for this webinar, that you will get a promo code uh, via email that will give you a discount should you sign up and attend the course. And of course, my objective this morning is, is to entice you to come to that course. I hope you'll see enough here that um, you'll learn that it would justify your investment of time and expense to come here. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, the, the course itself is three days long. I've pulled out uh, what I think are the, the essentials to understand the course, but it's a, it's a true training course. We actually teach techniques. So we start with a case exercise on the first day. We do a greenfield layout, a company that's going to build a new warehouse, and they want to take a clean sheet of paper approach, and so we, we lay it out. And then, then we spend some time that day talking about different ways of storing material and, and handling materials and the data that one would use to, um, to make those decisions. Second day is about the flow of materials and its measurement. Uh, we also cover space estimating on that day. And then we do a case exercise on that day to improve the flow of materials in an existing layout. So we're, we're trying to show you both and teach a methodology that's good for both situations, greenfield and brownfield, if you will, or, or improving what you have. And then on day three, we cover equipment layout. And then we have a major case problem on that day, sort of what I would call industrial strength problem that involves a warehouse expansion, some consolidation of split facilities into one, and, and even uh, the impact of introducing new products uh, into a, a plan that one already has. So that's maybe giving you a flavor in words of what we're going to do. The slides that I have queued up are going to try to give you a sense graphically and visually of, of what we do in the course. I'm not teaching you how to do anything in this hour. I'm just going to show you what we teach in the course. I won't be fully explaining each slide. We've got 50-something slides to go through, so some of these are going to be almost a blur. But my point in putting them in there is to give you a visual sense of what this method that we're teaching is all about. And, and deciding whether it's, it's of interest and would work for you. Uh, I'll click through some animations. I'm just going to just click through them. In class, with the case exercises, uh, we read the exercise. We use the information. Um, some of these slides are up on the screen for almost an hour because we're building up an analysis. So I'm just going to click through them in a few seconds here, but you'll get a flavor of what we would be doing in the class. Uh, time permitting, I've got one uh, show and tell example at the end that's people that actually graduated from our course and, and uh, did what I thought was a, a pretty impressive application, so I wanted to share that with you if we have time. The other thing we'll do, because uh, we are pressed for time and we have a hard stop here in our, in our uh, teaching room today at noon, uh, any questions that you'd have, I'd like for you to hold them, or send, if you're sending them in, we'll, we'll take them at the end. Uh, maybe you should send them when they occur to you, or you'll forget them. But we'll take them at the end if there's time. If there isn't time, I will respond by email afterwards. Um, you'll see some, some forms in this exercise, uh, or, or video, or presentation today that are on our website, our company website, and you're welcome to go there and look at those forms and, and download them there on a, uh, they're in Excel. Okay, let's get started. Uh, when we start the course, we talk about how did you get the layout that you already have? And most people, if you had to put a name on the process that you used, uh, you'd say, well, we just sort of did it. You know, we, we, someone was given the assignment and they came up with a plan. And we call that the instinct and experience approach. And that's how most layouts get play, uh, planned. There isn't really a process. Uh, other than getting some information and thinking about the problem and putting forth a proposal. The problem with it is you never know, did you look at all the relevant alternatives? Uh, you also have a hard time sometimes selling the result to the approvers. And um, we're all a product of our own experience, so there's some limitations there. Another approach is sort of a best practices approach. Let's, let's do one like these guys, but the less 
that we are exactly like those folks, the less that's going to work out as a good layout. Another approach is a, uh, I was going to say committee. None of us use that word anymore. Everybody's in a team. But a team uh, or a Kaizen event with a team, um, but again, without enough process. So uh, how do you trade off? If everybody around the table is an expert, everybody's got an idea, all the ideas are valid, it's very difficult to get consensus in a situation like that. Most of the textbooks on this field uh, reduce the layout to flow of materials. And that's, that's essential and probably the single most important um, perspective for warehouse and DC layout. But most of you could think of something pretty quick that's where it is in your layout for reasons other than flow of materials. So we need to, we need to find an organized way of getting that uh, kind of relationship into the plan. And that's how the systematic method, we call it SLP, systematic layout planning, evolved uh, many years ago as, as a universal approach that will get you a layout that doesn't, doesn't have the shortcomings of these other approaches. It's based on the notion of three fundamentals. The first being relationships. So the, the um, point here is to understand before you start actually doing the layout or moving racks around in AutoCAD is to say what are the activities being performed and what are the relationships between them? Which, which things need to be really close to each other or next to each other? Which can be further apart? Which don't matter? Where are you put them? and understanding those relationships first. Then, what is the footprint? And what kind of space do, do each of those activities need? How much, what kind, any dimensional requirements? Um, if I have relationships and space in front of me for all the areas that I'm gonna plan, and I know it'll fit into the space that's available, uh, the adjustment into a layout will go very quickly. And the first layout will be good because it's honoring the relationships. So, one of the issues in this field is people get into these loops and it takes a long time because you're sequentially uh, processing and you're getting it to a certain point. You say, well, I don't really understand how close that should be. I need to go ask somebody. Well, they're not there today or they're somewhere else or whatever. And so you, you lose time. Um, I'm not sure this will fit back there. I'm not sure even how much space we really need for this area. So you're stopping. And you're, you're basically learning the relationships in space while trying to do the layout. That's a very inefficient, time-consuming, extended process that we're trying to teach a, an approach here in our class that, that will make you much more productive at getting layouts. Uh, if you agree with that, or if that sounds right, then we can scale that up into a process or a procedure. And this is the simplified form of it. This is what we start with on the first morning, and then we execute this. We, ch we have a chart of relationships, that being the first fundamental. We've got a table uh, of space requirements that we've established. That's the second fundamental. And then before we do the adjustment, we make a diagram. Then we adjust into three or four what we call space relationships. They're really block layouts that we then evaluate, pick the best, and then hold the details till the end. Now that's maybe a subtle uh, point, but a lot of times if you try to detail each alternative, you run out of time. You don't have time to do that. It takes so long to do a detailed layout. So, um, and a lot of it's waste. All the ones that didn't get picked, that's just waste. So uh, if we can hold that detail till the end, we are more productive as planners. Now, I know that most of you out there are not professional full-time layout planners, almost nobody is anymore. So that's a hat that you wear now and then. And our purpose here is to try to make you a professional, good, high-performing layout planner or team leader of such a project uh, by, by going through a process. This is fairly typical of a case problem. It's just a short little simple case. There's a, a flow here of goods through a, a distribution center. Uh, the case goes on, it describes the situation. But in a nutshell, these folks have a, a, a new building that they're planning and we become them and we plan the layout following the procedure. Um, we start with a relationship chart. Now this is the single most important tool that you'd learn if you come to our event. It's, it's a, called a rated and reason supported relationship chart. What it does is it relates each pair 
of activities, each activity to each other activity in the layout. And you record the closeness that's desired using a vowel letter scale. Now, those of you that are trained in industrial engineering or got some exposure to it in school, you'll recognize this. It's in all textbooks. It's sort of a de facto standard based on the work that our firm did many years ago in this field. And this is not universal, but very widely used and familiar to people that have formal education in industrial engineering. But an A means closeness absolutely necessary. So, so those areas ought to end up touching in the finished layout. Uh, especially important uh, might, might be a little bit less uh, close. Now, each time we give a rating, we have to say why. And we code that with a reason. So down at the bottom of a chart like this is a box where we spell out the reasons for closeness. Uh, flow of materials being reserved for number one. And then we'll practice reading the chart. You read a chart like this at 45 degrees, so you have to read, learn that a little bit. Um, we practice reading and understanding why the relationships are what they are. Uh, we also discuss the distribution of ratings. So if you were to study this chart and add up the A's or the absolutely necessaries and the E ratings or especially important or the I or important ratings, you'd find out that there's a Pareto or an 80-20 distribution going on here where most of the relationships are unimportant or ordinary. Every now and then you have an X negative relationship, keep, keep things apart for some reason. Uh, and there's a total, there's a formula there. But the point being that this chart is sorting out the priorities for the layout. And we talk about how you would build such a chart, who you would involve and how long it would take. Um, the next thing we do, and I'm going to click through this, but we literally in class using this same ruler that you see on the screen there um, and a, a, a graphic convention here of distance, we draw the relationships. We visualize them on a diagram, and by convention in SLP, an A gets four lines, and the symbols are very close. And there's a couple of those in the, in the, in the um, problem. An E gets three lines, and the distance should be a little bit further apart. So, so we've got it set there in this example at three quarters of an inch. And the symbols change. I won't stop and talk about that today. It's actually in the kit that I gave you as a PDF. But the point being, we're, we're posting from the chart to a diagram. And when we do that, uh, eventually you get to a point where you've got all the A and E ratings on the screen, as I do now. And any of you looking at it there, you'll see one that jumps out at you and say, well, it's too long. I mean, everybody recognizes that it's too long. So um, what do we do about that? Well, we redraw. And, and so we would actually do this in class. It's a very simple, easily learned technique. You can learn this in an hour, and we do, and we teach it, and, and we practice doing it to the point where we get to, to be able to see, train our eye to see a visualization of whether it's optimal or not. And this redraw there, I've got two more lines that are too long. So that's what we're doing. And then you get to this, which is the redrawn and color-coded um, final activity relationship. That represents the theoretic, theoretical best arrangement of activity areas without regard to their size or the space that's available. So that's about as far as we can go with relationships. Then we talk about space. That's the second fundamental. Now here, the point in, in SLP is that the relationships uh, are gotten and the space is estimated for the same activity list. So um, you don't go to the computer and get your space one way because that's how you record it for accounting purposes. And then you get your relationships a different way because that's how somebody did it on a value stream map. You've got to have the same standard list that covers everything, 100%. And that allows you to, to work systematically as we're showing you here in this, this little illustration. So for that same list, I've got how much space I need. Then I've also got what kind of space because some space needs to be brightly lit, some doesn't. Um, some may need uh, temperature control or humidity control, others don't. Uh, I may need more electrical or, more comp or some compressed air or other features like that. So we record that. 
and then any shape or dimensional requirements for the areas. Now, if I have that and the relationships, I'm ready to do a layout. Now, I'm leaving out a few slides here, and that diagram that I'm showing you there is clearly upside down. But that's because when we drew it, area 11, which represents the office, was on the right-hand side. But the office in the actual building is on the left. So we have to flip this. And then we have a discussion about which dock would we like to use for receiving. And if we use the one near the restrooms, that's more convenient. If, if truckers or delivery people need to come in and, and use a restroom or something like that, it works better. So receiving is going to be in the lower left corner. And now I can do a layout very quickly by putting these areas in at scale. And so that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, we, we act, this is not the actual problem that we used the first morning in class, but it's similar in scope and, and scale. It's a, you know, in some sense a tinker toy problem, but it teaches you a method that you can then apply to any kind of warehouse or distribution center layout. So you get what's going on here. We're, we're basically realizing a layout, honoring the relationships in that diagram. And the good thing is, when we're done, and the space, when we're done, we can put the relationship lines on top of the layout and demonstrate that it's optimal. So if somebody says, well, why did you put that there? Well, we have this relationship, and here it is. It's visualized. They're as close as they could be. Uh, you know, it looks good. And then you get, oops, you know. Oh, my goodness. I'm visualizing something that maybe is not as good as it should be. So uh, in that situation, uh, maybe what I should do is, is, is do a second alternative. Now, what we learn in class is that if we understand the relationships in the space, and we're working on a grid at a relatively small scale like this, doing blocks, we can do two or three or four alternatives in a very short period of time. So there's not just one layout. There's not even just two layouts. There's typically three, four, five, six that might be good. And so then the challenge becomes to pick which one is best. And there's a step for that. And we're using something that you all probably have a, your version of this or you've seen it. It's called, we call it weighted factor. So we make a list of objectives or factors or considerations that matter to the decision. We put weights on them on a 10 to 1 scale. And then we rate, using the VAL code in a slightly different way, how well each of the alternatives perform on each of the factors. And because in SLP the, the ratings have a point value, I can multiply the rating by the weight and get a score. Uh, there are other versions of this uh, in, in management science, and you've, you've probably all been exposed to them or use them. But that's what we're doing at this step, trying to find a winner. Uh, which typically needs a uh, 12 to 15 percent spread to really to really be better. And then in the last step in this short form of the method, we're doing detail. Now think about this for a minute. I think you I think you're with me that if I had the diagram and I knew it was going to fit, I'd done my space estimates to actually generate those block layouts. I could do that in a morning. But how long would it take you to do one detailed layout if you felt that you had to show every rack? Should the racks be this way? Should the racks be that way? Maybe I need to study that. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get that answered by lunchtime. So um, the conveyors, is this the only way to do it? Is there a better way? Uh, the office, that could take weeks. So if, if we're trying to resolve all the details before we show anybody and get a decision, what happens to all the layouts that, that don't get picked? That, that represents the waste that I was talking about earlier. So you want to hold off on the details until the end. Now, because the folks who attend our class are, are going home to very diverse and, and sometimes very large facilities, that little simple six steps, that's not enough horsepower. So the full SLP method, which is on this uh, page here has a, a frame, we call it a framework of phases to, to give some structure to large projects. The planning is a whole phase devoted to the block and then another phase devoted to the details within the blocks. And in both cases, we're doing relationship space and adjustment, just like we demonstrated. And we're following a set of procedures and we're using some conventions, all of which is much too much to try to cover in this hour. But you get the idea. 
uh, those phases are kind of important. Um, a lot of times you're going to be asked to, to do layouts uh, when the location is still uncertain. And you can do a certain amount of block planning, but detail is almost surely waste at that point. Any more detail than you need to, to validate footprint uh, because you don't know what the building is yet exactly or the column spacing or where the docks are. So this is a project management device that helps you be a better leader and manager of layout planning projects. It doesn't speak to the essence of your layout or the analy analytics of getting the optimum layout, but it's a good way to run a project, to put that overall block uh, phase in place and then do your details once you've, finish your details or um, all of them once you've got the block decided. You have to do some detail in certain key areas, of course, but you don't want to sit there and draw every, every pallet rack on three alternatives that are going in the trash can. Then you're going to install. Um, this is a close-up of the pattern, we call it, the pattern of procedures that's on the right-hand side of the, of the capsule summary, that one-page overview of SLP. Uh, we don't have time to go through all these boxes today, but these boxes are basically working through relationship space and adjustment, the three fundamentals. And uh, the, the box on the left is basically inputs or analysis. The box on the right is the output or the deliverable or the, the key document. So that's what's going on in the pattern. Um, in the class, we spend about an hour and a half to two hours inside each of these boxes so that when you leave, you understand, okay, here's what I do when I get to that step. Oh, here's the pages that I can look back at as, as kind of cribbing. On, on what to do to get through that. Notice that when you get down to box four there, or section four, on the right-hand side, you have alternative layouts. That's, that's essential to systematic planning, is not to bring people into a room the first time they're seeing a, a, new, a proposed layout and have just one layout on the wall that you're trying to sell, but to put two or three or four good ones up there and involve them in picking, helping you pick which one is best. Don't, don't fall in love with your your first plan and, and then try to sell it. You get a better result if you work the other way around. So that, that we talk about at some length in the class. The inputs, those are listed up at the top and that's the starting point. We have probably, oh, if, if you add it up over the course of the week, about four hours on the information that it takes to do a good job of layout planning. And for ease of recall, we use this little memory jogger here, this idea of the key and a sequence of five letters in the alphabet that we all learned in kindergarten. Product or material, P, what is it that we're, we're housing in this layout? What are, we, what are we working on? What are we receiving, putting away, picking, shipping? So the physics of it. How much, Q, how much flow, how much level, how much inventory when it's at rest. R is the routing. We should say P for process, but we already use P, so you can't do that twice. Routing is the sequence of operations that are performed on the product or material from the time it enters to the time it leaves. S is all the things that don't show up in a, in a value stream map or a process flowchart. Uh, the battery charger, the maintenance bay, the cafeteria, the weight room, or, or exercise room, I guess. I should. Are we going to have an exercise room in this layout? Or is it good enough just to leave the barbells back there in the back aisle the, the way we, we always have? Uh, okay, we have to decide that because we don't, want to, we don't want to go all the way down to the end and somebody say, hey, where's the exercise room? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't know we were going to have one. So little things like that that slow you down uh, in, in, in the nature of support, uh, we flag there as a list basically. And time refers to hours of operation to seasonality, to cutoffs that may be affecting the, the flow rates, um, anything that, that uh, interrupts flow or causes dislocation and, and the need for buffering, uh, we want to figure that out early uh, before we sit down to, to actually start doing layouts and, and even relationships. So that's what this is. And I put a page in here to explain that because that terminology would be kind of strange to you. But you can read that after, after class uh, here today. Uh, that's in your deck. The other thing that, that happens up at the top of SLP is a discussion of the type of layout. Uh, what, 
what's the overall concept for how we want to organize the facility? And we have a session on this where we talk about keeping like kinds of materials together, big stuff, heavy stuff, conveyable stuff, non-conveyable stuff, that kind of thing. Uh, all of a certain customer's things together, velocity together, fast movers here, reserve there, uh, cross stock in this area, um, all of a certain kind of rack together or, or the activity for a certain specialized truck, keeping all of that together. And most large warehouses are going to be a combination of these four types. And so we have that, that discussion as well. Um, almost always, there's some grouping that's going on in your layouts. So this is a checklist that we talk about the physical factors on which you can create zones and groups of, of merchandise based on size, weight, shape, uh, stackable, not stackable, conveyable, not conveyable, those kinds of things, uh, long and thin, risk, condition. Uh, condition could be dirty, it could be uh, needs refrigeration, it could be smelly, you know, don't, don't put this next to that or the other thing will smell like the other one. Um, it could have to do with popularity or velocity or order quantity, those things that are always only ordered as full pallets, for example. So there's a checklist, and we, we go through the application of this and the understanding of how it can help you get from hundreds or thousands of SKUs that you may, or even tens of thousands. We've had people in the class who have close to 100,000 SKUs in some cases. How do you get that down to 15 or 20 um, groupings or zonings that are going to make sense for organizing your facility. Um, okay, another thing we do, mostly on day two, is flow analysis. We spend a lot of time on this. So how do you know when you look at two layouts, which one is better from material flow and by how much? And we have a case exercise. It's not this one, but it's very similar to this. And we actually struggle through and work through so that we actually understand how exactly do you find, define better flow? What, is, what does that mean? Uh, is it more direct? Is it shorter distance? Is it less material handling effort? Is it cost? How are you going to measure it? How exactly are you going to compare the two plans? And what information are you going to need? So, so this is uh, learned by doing. We, we take some data and then we figure out if we can do better than the existing layout and by how much. Um, the, the, the organizing principle here is called a movement summary. And what we're doing is we're making a list of routes, which we understand from the key input letter R, routing. We understand where the flows are going in that layout and which products P are moving on which routes R and in what quantity Q. So we're taking the key inputs for a process and we're putting them on a table. So there's the, there's the flow, there must be a route there, that route in the layout goes from one to two, okay? Um, and then by grouping the materials, we've got classes, and then we quantify the flow in a given unit of measure. And we have a discussion, this, hap this example happens to be in weight. You can't use weight if you have different densities of material. So we have that discussion about when you can use weight, when you should use cube, uh, how you should adjust cube for other factors. And we go ahead and populate this chart. And we ask ourselves some questions about which routes have the very high flows and what does that mean? Um, and and we, so we're, we're understanding that these actual numbers can be converted to vowel letter ratings, A's, E's, I's, like we were talking on, on the relationship chart. So I'm using a convention here of SLP, uh, A-E-I-O-U uh, rating. And we also uh, can see that in a Pareto. So we make a Pareto chart that's got uh, a conversion there where you see a shoulder in that distribution. You can turn it into a vowel letter. Now, why do we want to do this? We want to do this for two reasons. Uh, if I get the vowel letters for the flows, I can put them together with any vowel letters for the other than flow. And that gives me an organized or systematic way of getting all my relationships into one chart. So some of it is for that reason. Uh, the other reason we're doing it is when we want to visualize these flows, we need to do it quickly. We don't want to make a science project out of it. 
So we, we are going to use numbers of lines to represent flow values rather than quibble over the width of a line between 105 and 100 or uh, 45 and 35. We'll just say, give it four lines if it's really intense. Give it three lines if it's very intense, two lines if it's in the middle, and one if maybe even a dotted line if it barely matters. And, and we then ask ourselves, in a good layout, which of these routes should be the shortest? Well, it's the ones with four lines. That's fairly obvious. We also talk about if I was planning the material handling system, um, which class should I plan first? In this example, it would be small packages because they're the most, uh, the most handled items. So we have that discussion. Then we go and, and say, OK, suppose I could tell you what the distance is for each of those routes in the current layout. So I, if I had the layout and I measured the distance of Route 1 to Route 2, what is it? How far does that material travel? And then we're going to get into a discussion of, well, are you measuring as the crow flies? Are you measuring uh, right angle? Are you measuring actual path? And so that will get discussed. But however we do it, we're going to get uh, a way of doing that and a, and a calculation of distance times intensity. And we call that transport work. And if I asked you then which routes are the most costly, you're going to generally say, well, it's the ones that are the highest in that, in that rightmost column there. So what we're, we're, we're introducing here is the notion of transport work. Now, if I had another layout that had different distances, have the same volume because we're selling the same amount of product. But if I had different distances, I could plug those into a spreadsheet, and I could calculate the total transport work or material handling effort for each plan. And I would see in this case that, that uh, the, the, the proposed plan is about 15% better than the, um, than the current. And we could talk about whether that matters. You know, if you have two guys doing the material handling, that doesn't matter. But if you have 20, it probably does. Uh, so uh, that's what we're teaching in a nutshell. And we spend basically a day learning how to do that, including how to visualize that flow on the layout. So we take those numbers of lines and we basically draw onto the current layout what the, what the flow looks like. And then working in teams, we rearrange this facility and see if we can do better. Now this is called a quantified flow diagram. It's an essential document in doing um, good systematic uh, warehouse DC layouts. So we teach that. Um, we actually take a cut to see who, who we, don't, we don't get into who did the best, but, but we get typically four, five, six different ideas for how to rearrange this, this building. And some people do much better, and some people do a little bit better, but everybody improves it in some way. And you can compare them visually with another quantified flow diagram, which we do. And the really dramatic ones, you can see from all the way across the room that they're better than what you started with. Others, maybe not so much. And, and, and that would show also in the calculation. There's yet another tool that we teach from the same data. Rather than visualizing the flow on a layout, is to put it on a scatter plot. We call it a distance intensity plot. And so basically, we're, we're putting points on a, on a chart as a function of their distance left to right there across the bottom axis, and their, their flow rate, if you will. We call it the intensity on the vertical axis. And so you'll get a distribution of points. And then we spend a fair amount of time, probably a couple hours in the class, talking about what this tells us about how to move those materials through that layout and whether the layout itself has any issues. And so we get into a discussion of direct and indirect moves. Um, in an indirect system, a uh, conveyor with diverts or a tugger and carts, basically you'll find your candidates for that in this quadrant of the chart. So th those, those moves there are the grist for that kind of a solution, and we discuss that. Uh, we also discussed the notion that in an optimal layout, all these points should be declining to the right as you look at it. You shouldn't be climbing to the right. That means that your higher intensities are, are going um, uh, 
farther and farther. So that's not good. Um, and, and so we have a discussion about if I could take the transport work, the area behind that point, the intensity times the distance, and cut it in half uh, on that route, but it cost me down at the bottom of this chart, I had to double some other route that had virtually no intensity, that would be a very good thing. So you can see graphically in, in this way, and you can actually engineer an improved layout from a table like this when we talk about that. There's also a brief discussion about uh, unit loads and uh, mixed loads. If you're stuck with a layout uh, where you can't reduce the distance, what do you do? And we talk about that from a material handling perspective and what kind of equipment might be appropriate for each of those different types of moves. Um, I mentioned space. We teach five techniques or ways to determine space. They're shown on this page. Uh, each has, a, has its appropriate use, and we practice a couple of those, calculation and conversion in particular. Um, so uh, we do that. We talk about what drives your need for space, the business drivers that are actually causing you to need more space. Um, I've listed the, the seven major ones here that we, we discuss. And we also have a checklist that's got about 80 80 or 90 ideas for how to save space when you're short. Um, things that the organization can do, not just buying a, a high density storage system, but other, other ways of different kinds of scheduling, different kinds of purchasing, uh, maybe even different kinds of packaging uh, that, would, that would have an impact. Uh, the course does not teach, uh, it's not a course about pallet rack and different types of rack or different types of storage. But we do give a framework for understanding the, the most popular eight or nine or ten ways that people store unitized loads. Generally, that means pallets. It doesn't always, but generally uh, uh, palletized material. So uh, for folks that are coming that, that don't have exposure to racks or are wondering, is there a different way to store my materials, we have uh, uh, at least an orientation in a systematic way to the, the position that different types of rack take relative to inventory level, relative to space available, and relative to the flow intensity of the materials that's moving through those racks. And um, we act, this is actually a puzzle that we work, and we try to place those pieces in the best arrangement based on some business conditions that they're trying to fix. So it's, it is a course about layout, but, but you have a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing going on in warehouse layout. Do, do, do I have the layout that I have because of the way I handle and store, or do I handle and store to enable the layout? How does that work? And we try to, to our best ability to sort that out with, with uh, eight or nine or ten factors that you'll see on this page here that are relating to the choosing of the right way to store and handle materials. Um, I mentioned this idea of the, the two phases, the overall or block and then the detail. We teach the course mostly about blocks because it's easier in, in a diverse audience for people to, to approach it that way. Uh, uh, we have folks that are in very different kinds of facilities typically in, in, a, in an event like this. And there's some learning that goes on from that. I think you, you typically learn from your classmates. But we have people that are, are kidding for production lines. We have people that are in consumer direct or retail distribution. Um, or, or bulk chemicals, so, so um, a lot of diversity. Uh, and it's easier to teach it at a block level. But when we do discuss um, layout, the same process that we used for block can be used again for the details in any area where you need that kind of uh, analysis. Uh, we show an example. It happens to be this one. I don't intend for you to actually read all of those charts up there, but to understand that this, this is a layout plan and its process on a page uh, using SLP to do equipment layout in a shipping department. So we started with some inputs. We made a list of areas. We figured out how we wanted to organize the space. Uh, we got some relationships. We got our space. Our space now is very specific. It's dealing with objects that have to be placed, benches, racks, conveyors. And so we do a diagram, more likely a diagram of templates, 
uh, and we adjust that into alternatives just for this one area. But now it's equipment layout. You're, you're not seeing blocks. You're seeing the actual equipment, which gets evaluated to pick the best. So, so that gets uh, covered. Um, along the way, we are talking about some of the challenges of pallet rack. We have folks who come who, who basically have never actually personally done a layout. So they don't quite see some of the things that are going to emerge about column interference and, and the dimensional issues of liftoff, of getting pallets out of racks and cross beam depths and flue spaces between back-to-back -back racks. So there's a certain amount of learning that goes on about, about pallet rack layout and a little bit like that on shelving. These next few slides um, I'm going to run through as an example uh, to make the point that in addition to these various techniques that we're teaching, we, we want you to leave with a planning process, a system that, that would help you plan any kind of layout or manage or lead any kind of layout planning project. So I thought I'd string together, uh, in a nutshell, what you learn in our class and what it would look like when you go home and actually apply it. This is, this is the phase one of a, of a layout. About, this is about a quarter of a million square feet with a couple of expansion possibilities and some monuments. The process chart that you would prepare, we teach this, this symbology and notation and how to do this. The uh, activity list that you would generate from your groupings and your use of that 15 point checklist to decide how you want to organize the space. Uh, the flow analysis converted to vowel letters so I can put it together with the other than flow. So here's the other than flow relationships in this quarter of a million square feet. There aren't too many, but there's about eight or nine or ten there if you include the X's that, that matter, that, that need to be reflected in the final result. And they may be in conflict with the flow, so, so you have to work this out in an orderly way. So we do, and we teach how to combine flow and other into a final set of relationships that you can put on a chart. Uh, you make a diagram of that. I already showed you that here in this hour, but uh, that's something that we, we, we look at a couple of times, uh, how to do that. In this case, because you've got an existing uh, facility, that, that diagram gets torqued around a little bit to reflect where the docks actually are. You're not going to change that in this situation. You've got your space estimates, and we, we talk about this particular form and how to populate it. You could do templates. You could do it electronically. Uh, we favor uh, the template approach uh, because it gets people involved to getting these three or four plans. We're sort of, uh, we, get, we get a little bit preachy at times in the, in the course, but the one thing that, that we've noticed over, over many years is that if you do the, the layout planning on a computer, uh, let's say AutoCAD, which would be the default way of doing it, the person who's the AutoCAD jockey ends up doing the layout. Everybody else is texting, or they went for coffee, or they, 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 did, they did something else. And they come back and say, well, why did you do that? Um, a much better approach is to get a team of people in a room. And the layouts don't happen unless each of those team members takes the template and puts it where they think it ought to go to honor the relationships that we develop. This is a room full of people on the, at the end of this is day four. Uh, there are six plans there for a million square feet of, of facility. And there were, I think, four or five teams that developed those, kind of competing with one another a little bit in a friendly way. And now they're going around and understanding what each other team did and whether they like it or don't like it. Those little flimsy tracing papers there are the overlays. That's the quantified flow diagram for, for each of the layouts. So that, that's a technique that we're giving you and showing you how to do and we practice that, that hopefully after you leave our class, you never do another layout where you, you come in and wave your hands and tell everybody how good it's going to be. You show them with a diagram that's based on the quantity that you're actually going to move through the layout. Um, but you still got the issue of which plan is best and flow is not, not the only factor. So we go to, through the evaluation and we, and we, get, a, we get an answer. Um, I'm on the bubble time-wise if we have questions, but I, I think I've got enough time to show you one more. Um, this is 800,000 square feet, and this was planned by a team that received the SLP training. Uh, this was a block layout done in about a week. Situation, 
and this is very, the reason I put this in here, the, the, core, the problem that we tackle on, on the third day is what I said was an industrial strength problem. It's not this thing that I'm showing you, but it's basically this, disguised or very similar, where I have an existing facility and I'm going to add on to it and I'm going to put some storage in there and it's going to affect my current layout and I've got to come up with a plan. Um, and that's what's going on here. How, how do we want to lay out the, the expansion and what changes, if any, do we want to make to the current space? The flow analysis as a, as a flow process chart using the, the notational symbols of SLP. Um, the flow of materials analysis and the other, putting that together using, using the uh, Excel templates that you can get off our website. The putting together, combining of the flow and other. Now this is a little, this, you can actually read this one if you want to take a second to look at it. But what's going on here is on the left side, the first column of, of uh, colored letters is the flow rating in vowel letter, A, E, I, uh, that corresponds to the numerical two-way flow value that was estimated by the, the flow analysis team. And if you see in the middle, right smack in the middle of the page, it says weight or WT, and it's a, you see a bunch of twos there. If you look up at the top, it says ratio of flow. Uh, flows greater than 5,000 a year. That's, that's what that, that meant. To other than flow, two to one. This is a technique of overweighting the flow. This is a high volume uh, uh, DC in the grocery industry that says, hey, flow as an issue is twice as important to us as all that other stuff. So we're overweighting that in coming up with the combined relationships. And we, we show how to do that in the class. Here's the diagram. Here's the space. There are the templates. Here's the first layout done with paper dolls by four people in a room. Uh, working on it for a couple hours. Uh, here's their flow index. There's the overlay, just like we do in class. Here's plan B. These guys are in another room. Somewhat friendly competition. Guess what? Their flow index is 293. That's pretty different than 368. This, this one is actually 20% less material flow than the other one. In 800,000 square feet, that really matters. So, so, and I can see where they're getting that, where they're getting that, that, uh, that boost. So we might have three or four or five, you know, and then we're going to do an evaluation. Now, something else that we discuss, and this is real world, uh, those four plans might have been our best four shots in the first day that we worked it. But when we put them up on the wall and we start discussing it as a group and we bring some other people in, y y you've all been there. There's the one person who wasn't involved. And they come in and say, well, wait a minute. If you took these features from this plan and those two features from that plan, you'd have a really good plan. It'd be better than anything you, you put up there on the wall. So this happens. And in this example, there's a couple of extra columns. I know I'm not giving you copies of this. You're only seeing this on the screen. It's, it's real stuff. So I, I, can't, I can't be putting this out on the internet, but it, it's somebody's actual stuff. But, but uh, they... Uh, they said, okay, let's engineer, let's engineer plan E, plan F by combining the best features of plans that we already have on, on the board there. And so their, their final selected plan is even better than the, than the four that they started with. And I would submit, obviously I'm biased because I teach the class, but, but, but I think what we're teaching you is a path to getting the best possible layout through this kind of a, of a participative process get a lot of eyes and minds looking at it, thinking about it, an orderly way of seeing what's good in each plan and how you might actually come up with a synthesized plan that's, that's better than anything that you actually went in with. Now, this one's done in the computer. It's not paper dolls. And you have to get from those templates into, back into that world for engineering purposes. But uh, uh, that's a pretty good summary uh, of, of a, a week of people applying what they've learned in, in our course. And that's the last slide that I had. Um, we're even a minute or two ahead of schedule. I was going to ask any questions. Well, I've, either, I've either talked so fast nobody dared ask a question, uh, or, or you're not interested. I don't know which. But 
if, if you do think of a question or you have any kind of follow-up after seeing this, um, send it in and we'll respond by, by email. And um, we'll hope to see you in November or at some other venue. We, we, we run this uh, annually, I think it is, in November. Uh, so um, we look forward to you attending, and thanks for your attention today. Thank you.